side and the wrong things on the wrong side. Cosine equals 87 divided by 105, the square root of 105. I mean, I can't always be their little girl. father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my grandfather, my grandmother, my family. Of all the things that shape our lives, fewer are as powerful or as lasting as the family. They are universal, yet each unique. Individual family members, personal relationships, social status, and culture blend to provide a rich mixture that helps mold the developing child. childhood, children begin to define themselves in ever wider contexts as they interact with other children and adults outside the home. Still, for most young children, the family remains the centerpiece for regulation, direction, and support. <laughs> when researchers have tried to boil down these different dimensions of parenting, um, to, to ask really what works, what combination of different things helps kids grow up in the most healthy way. They've come up with clusters of parent characteristics. There are the authoritative parents who are very warm and yet firm and democratic with their kids. There are the indulgent or permissive parents who are also very warm but who don't set a lot of standards or guidelines for their children's behavior. There are authoritarian parents who set a lot of guidelines and are very strict with their children but aren't particularly warm in the way that they deal with them. And then finally there are what we call disengaged or uninvolved parents who aren't very warm toward their children and aren't very active in monitoring or setting limits for their behavior. All right, I just have to drop the kids at school and I'm on my way. Okay, thanks, bye. The cluster that seems to be the healthiest is what we call authoritative parenting. And that's a combination of high warmth, relatively high behavioral control and high psychological autonomy granting. And kids who grow up in authoritative homes do better in school. They score higher on measures of psychosocial development like self-esteem or self-reliance. They report fewer symptoms of depression and anxiety and they report considerably less problem behavior like drug and alcohol use or delinquency. If you take the four groups of parents and you look at the children raised in those different styles, what you find is that on all measures of competence and adjustment, the kids who are raised in authoritative families do the best, and the kids who are raised in the disengaged or the uninvolved families do the worst. Uh-uh, just a second, let me get the phone. If you compare the kids in the permissive and the authoritarian families, what you find is that the kids in permissive families do fine on measures of self-esteem and psychosocial development but they look worse on measures of problem behavior. If you look at the authoritarian kids, you find just the opposite. On measures of problem behavior, they look fine, but on measures of how they feel about themselves um, and on measures of depression and anxiety, they look worse than other kids do. While parenting style usually remains constant, the nature of the parent-child relationship evolves as the child matures. Early on, the parent's job is to regulate the child and you move through development to co-regulation where we're in a partnership regulating you. You and I together are regulating you. To a place by late middle childhood where you're doing most of the regulating and what I'm doing is monitoring. I'm keeping an eye on how you're regulating and I'm monitoring your whereabouts and I'm monitoring uh, how well you're doing and there are times when I'll step in. Okay, and then we just run it down and that will make this fence kind of waterproof. Parents no. at all ages are necessary as resources. You could come. Parents at all ages have a responsibility to set limits and provide limits and guidelines that the child can't. It just changes over time what those limits and guidelines are that are needed from the parent. 
In middle childhood, um, there is a lot of structuring that parents still do. One way parents structure the child's environment and foster social development is by promoting the child's sense of responsibility. One of the meanings of responsibility is that you should be able to do things without being reminded, without being prompted, and uh, without having to be rewarded. So that's one aspect of being responsible, is that you're essentially self-regulating. If you created this problem, you should try to fix it. If you're responsible for this error or this foul up, then you should try to do something about it. Scott! What happens is that children acquire very early a sense of what's yours and what's mine. Get this game picked up? That game's not mine. Mikey brought it in here. He was playing with it. Oh, I You can feel quite exploited if you're expected to do some things that you feel are not, not appropriate for you. What we were trying to do then was to backtrack to find what's the underlying rule or the underlying principle behind that feeling that it's unfair or it's insulting or that it's exploitive and so forth. And we've given it what may seem a rather amazing title. We've called it the, the principle of direct cause. And uh, basically, if you put that in colloquial terms, it means that uh, there seems to be acquired very early the expectation that if, if you've made this mess, you should clean it up. Scott, this looks great. The only thing left to do is make your bed. There are all kinds of ways in which you can promote in children a sense that they ought to contribute to the family and you could do it by way of saying everybody has to clean up his or her um, plate or put it in the sink or in the dishwasher or you could do it by saying that you're responsible for looking after a younger child or responsible for keeping things tidy and increasingly what we're coming to feel not just in terms of household jobs but a whole lot of other behaviors um, carrying on a conversation telling a story um, following through an argument, you know, presenting a case as to why you shouldn't do something, that what makes an interaction smooth in a family or outside the family as well is a knowledge of the rules that ought to be followed. Everybody assumed that the real potent influence on children's development was parents. But I began to see things that were happening between children and their young brothers and sisters that suggested that this was really something that could be an enormously important influence. Siblings, whatever the number, affect each other's development in the context of parental care and monitoring. For the Keels, a family with five children, the family dynamics are particularly complex. The sense of competition, the sense of pushing one another, um, the jealousies, they're all there. There's also a tremendous sense of support and camaraderie, and boy, when it gets down to it, they stick in there for one another. We certainly have knockdown drag outs, and there are days that everybody spends the day in their room. But in general, there's a sense of we know that our best support comes from one another, and we do everything we can to maximize that. Children spend all day, every day, with their brothers and sisters when they're small. And it's a relationship that varies dramatically. For some children, it means growing up with someone who's affectionate, supportive, and brings you into games, and comforts you when you're sick or tired or upset. For other children, it means growing up with another child who hits you over the head, takes your toys, beats you up, makes sure you don't get attention from your mother. And just on common sense terms, I think any parent who, who has more than one child would agree that what's going on might be important in their development. Kirby, what did you do in vacation Bible school today? There was this fat glue stick and we made these little um, humans on them. Humans? Yeah. Well, what kind of human did you make? I made a boy. We range from the age of 4 to 13, so um, it's a pretty widespread age variety, so no one really ever feels lonely. Most of the time I get along with my brothers and sisters, although sometimes I would like to give them to the gypsies, but most of the time I get along with them. 
having an older sibling in the family can be beneficial to the child in, in several ways. It provides the child with the possibility of having a confidant. We think that another role that the sibling, older sibling plays is as a buffer to absorb some of the stress that the child may experience having been exposed to uh, the mother's discussions of her problems. And in fact, that the presence of these older siblings probably reduces the mother's um, tendency to discuss these problems with a younger child. Okay, gang, thanks for coming in. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting of the Keel family to order. I think because we are such a large family, um, we've been real honest with the children about both the pros of coming from a large group and, and there are some definite cons. There are times that they wish they had more individual attention from me or from my husband or from their grandmother or whoever, and that isn't always possible. The advantage to that is it's never boring around here. I, I can't remember the last time a child has come to me and said there's nothing to do. There's always something to do around here. There's always someone to do it with. Um, and the advantages, as far as I'm concerned, certainly outweigh the disadvantages. Okay, so that's unanimous then, everybody? Mm -hmm. We'll make SeaWorld one of them? Definitely. Okay, good. Kendra, you're next. Well, I think we should go to the Santa Ana Zoo. Oh, well, that's an idea. Well, that's everybody who wants to go raise your hands. Looks unanimous to me. Okay. <laughs> when Corey, the Keel's oldest because. child, became ill, her sibling role was affected. For the past four years, She's kind of taken over the role of being the oldest. And now you want it back. But she won't let you. <laughs> what do you want to do? Go youngest to oldest or oldest to youngest? Youngest to oldest. I don't really care because I'm always the third. You're always in the middle. <laughs> That's true. I'll be in the middle this time. You'll be in the middle this time. While birth order or ordinal position certainly has an effect on children, its significance to personality development is still under debate. When we do studies to see uh, are there differences in firstborn children to laterborn children, we do find certain differences, such as uh, firstborn children are generally higher achievers than laterborn. There's lots of ideas around about what difference it makes if you're the firstborn, if you're an only child, if you're the middle one, if you're the lastborn. And do I need more the people who've done the large-scale studies that look very carefully at lots of children have tended to find that those myths really are myths, that there aren't personality characteristics that are specially characteristic of being a middle child. Um, for instance, one of the myths is that firstborn children are more neurotic, more anxious to please their parents, uh, more achievement-oriented, and so on. And on the whole, that's not been borne out when we've looked at lots and lots of families. If you take account of people who have achieved eminence or who are li listed in who's who, you find a disproportionate number of firstborn children. Um, you also, firstborn children frequently show uh, patterns of more um, old socialization, responsibility, uh, more conformity to um, adults. Uh, than do last born, for example. So there are certain personality differences that come up that seem to reflect some of these patterns. What's this for, Mom? Um, did you watch? Did you watch, Mama? Mama? We have a good time, and I think maybe if there's one thing that we all try to remember, it's that like, you can take yourself too seriously real easily. And so we try to laugh a lot, and sometimes it's like you laugh instead of cry, <laughs> and, and you know. Um, but I, I think if there's a thread that runs through things, perhaps that's it. We have a tremendous amount of outside support, friends and family, that mean an awful lot to us. And they've been there through both the bad times and the good times, and there have been a lot of both. Um, my husband and I both come from small families. We both just have a brother, and so initially we hadn't planned on a family this size. It just kind of evolved as time went on, and I wouldn't have it any other way now. I like having brother and sister because um, they like me. Brothers and sisters are... Excuse me? Lovable pains. <laughs>
While the family provides unique circumstances and experiences for a child's development, each family is, in part, defined by the economic, social, and cultural context in which it operates. What's important to understand is that parenting occurs in a context, and that context really does have a major impact on the quality of parenting. So if a parent is functioning in the context of isolation, in the context of few economic resources, in the context of high levels of emotional e economic stress, and low levels of emotional support, that is going to influence her beliefs about how this child needs to be socialized in order to be able to cope in this environment. So it, it really is not sensible to assume that there's a right and a wrong way of parenting or that there's some universal style of parenting that we should all be aspiring to. Thank you. Most of the data, most of the information that we gather focuses on middle class American parents. And we make the assumption then that what middle class parents do is what every parent does and therefore every child develops the same way. So the issue of culture is interesting because we need to know, do these patterns that we see among Anglo-American middle class families apply in all other contexts where children develop? One of the things that we find in the literature and the media is that whenever they talk about blacks and Afro-American children, they tend to only focus in on the problematic ones, the children who are born to mothers with drugs, uh, children who are low birth weight and what this is important and this is a crucial uh, area of concern and this is an area that needs a great deal of work but at the same time we have to remember that the majority of black families are working class they are, may not be making a great deal of money but they're not dependent upon government for uh, support however this is not handled in the literature even many developmental psychologists make the same mistake we designed the study of Mexican-American, Anglo-American, working class and middle class mothers in a way that would allow us, first of all, to determine whether social class or cultural background, which of those two was more important in influencing how mothers taught their children. <laughs> We expected to find that social class played a larger role. Even though many studies that had been done in the field seemed to indicate that Mexican-American mothers behaved differently than Anglo-American mothers, we really felt that what was happening there was that the, middle, the studies of the Mexican-American mothers used primarily working or lower class mothers. So we expected social class would have a larger impact on mothers' behavior, and it did. Um, that finding was very clear from our study that at least on the kinds of teaching behaviors that we looked at, Hispanic mothers are not partic particularly different um, from Anglo mothers when you keep them in the same social class. I think that we in psychology and social science have to accept the fact that the nuclear family, the two-parent family, is no longer the dominant family in America. We just have to accept that that's the way it's going to be. A child who comes from divorced parents now is no longer atypical. We, we don't think of a divorced family really as a deviant family in any way. But the experience of children seems to remain the same, and I don't see any decreases in how difficult it is for children to cope with their divorce status. Sean McCullum's parents were divorced four years ago when he was only six years old. <laughs> Sean is supported not only by his mother, but by an extended family that includes his grandparents, his aunt, and his uncle John. Good shot, not gonna run. This support for Sean extends off the field as well. Ten to eight. Who won? Them? No, they didn't. We won. We won. We did. Did they 
Baseball is the most important thing in Sean's life. When he was in school, as far as checking out books in the library for book reports and that kind of thing, everything that came home was baseball or basketball. And I'd say, well, don't you think you should pick something else out? There's life beyond baseball. And he'd say, no, there isn't. And, and uh, he's asked for several years, but financially it was hard to get him into baseball for a while. And so a couple of years ago, I said, well, if everything goes okay, we'll get you in. And now he's been in and we don't come out. <laughs> We're almost year-round baseball now. So it's real important to Sean. Come on, let's throw some strikes. I think sports is a good outlet. It, it burns their energy and it, I think it keeps them out of trouble. It keeps them busy after school and that kind of thing. So no, I think it's real important. It's a consuming passion, basically. And he's got that passion burning in him. I don't want him to become a passive child sitting in front of a television set five hours a day and then playing Nintendo and video games and all that. So from an uncle's viewpoint, I set out to buy things for him or give him avenues to use energy of being outdoors, get outside, play sports or, or anything that was type of a physical activity instead of being a passive child. He grabbed a hold of every opportunity I had for him. Who's your favorite player on the Angels right now? My phone, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, Because he plays like you. Yeah, he plays... Same kind of style. No, but he doesn't play shorts. No, but you guys run the bases the same way. I had expected I the effects of divorce to be greatest on boys. And I'd expected this for two reasons. First, vo boys are more vulnerable to family conflict. There's a great body of research on this, uh, on this topic. Second, I thought that the presence of a father would be more important for boys uh, than for girls. And certainly research uh, on divorce suggests if you're looking at children before the age of adolescence, children, uh, it's the boys who suffer the most adverse effects. Now, you've got to keep in mind that most of these children are residing with a mother, not with a father. However, something I had not expected was that in early adolescence, daughters who previously were doing very well uh, in their family relations and in general adjustment in school and in the peer group started to exhibit very early acting out sexual behavior. So these kids became sexually active, became pregnant uh, much earlier than kids whose parents had not gone through a divorce. Uh, there are a number of factors that are related to how well children adjust to divorce. The first are individual differences in the child. We've been talking about gender, but such factors as age of the child is important. Uh, and temperament of the child is important. The second group of fa uh, factors are family factors, and these are very powerful factors, and they interact with the individual differences in the characteristics of the children. So you find that uh, if you have a parent who, after divorce, is able to be competent, who's warm and loving, communicates well with the child, but is firm in control, uh, that the children will eventually do very well. Uh, however, many parents after divorce are suffering a great deal of emotional anguish themselves. And a preoccupied, disengaged parent isn't very much help to a bewildered, uh, demanding child, and they often exacerbate each other's problems. The third factor that's related to the vulnerability or resiliency of children are factors external to the family. So you think of good peer relationships, a supportive grandparent, uh, a warm adult or teacher, uh, being successful at school, because having one arena of success and recognition can buffer a lot of the pain that children suffer in other situations. It was real hard for me to go to work and to leave him at a babysitter or a stranger and to be able to work and not feel that guilt that you sometimes feel from leaving the child behind crying and screaming at the doorstep. 
So um, as my mom got more comfortable being around them, she felt like she could handle it a little more. And so they, they got involved when they were quite young. And um, off and on, they've still been with sitters and different people who have been with them. But I don't think there's quite the same love as you get from a grandparent that, that watches over her grandchild. <laughs> so what happened, what happened when that guy ran into you at second? He was out. Knocked face you down? Hurt. Your face hurt? <laughs> he ran into your face? I think what the single parent family people need to do is get in connected to other families, get connected to other extended family groups and not try to battle the thing alone. And there are more and more single parent families who are joining various different groups coming together for forums, talks and so on, and not try to do this thing alone to go back to interdependence. The fact that the nephews are there to kind of bring us back together, it keeps a connection and a closeness to the family that might not otherwise be there. They might look to me more as, as a father figure, basically. They never had the opportunity to really go out and play ball with their dad or to go places with their father. So I've kind of assumed part of that role, but it's not like a responsibility. It's, it's a pleasure. It's something that you get nothing but enjoyment out of. And if I could have two kids someday, I would love to have kids along those lines, like Sean and Nick. They're, they're both great. <laughs> Since every experience and circumstance that touches the child affects development in some way, it is little wonder that the family stands out as an enduring force shaping our lives. Who we are and how we view ourselves and others is indelibly imprinted by the family.